G'day Jaffa Adventures, Terry King here. Welcome to the channel. I've got something a little bit different for you this time around. I've got a really good mate of mine, Matt, coming over and we're going to wrench on my 57 Chevy today. It's got a pretty bad exhaust leak that I've got to address. But I thought this would be a great opportunity to sort of go through the history of the restoration of this car. This took me eight and a half years to restore and I don't even want to guess how much money I've spent on this thing. But this car was a dream of mine when I was well, probably 10 or 12 years old. I wanted a red 57 Chevy and here it is. So Matt's pulling in the driveway now. We'll get this car out of the bay. We'll start wrenching on it. I'll take you and me down restoration memory lane as we wrench on this thing. So I've got good mate Matt and his son Brock over and we're gonna pull this sucker apart. So the issue is I've got an exhaust manifold leak. And as you can see, there is no way you can get in there. So we're gonna have to take this entire front clip off and the bonnet just to get to those, what, eight bolts that hold the exhaust manifold on. My love of cars all started with my dad who owned a 57 when he was dating my mom. It was actually his fourth car after a 1950 black Ford, a 51 metallic green Merc, and a 54 purple Merc two-door hardtop that he did all the body work on, and it had gallons of Bondo in it. He bought his 57 two-door hardtop in 61 for $200. It was a mess as it had sat for a couple of years, a complete rust bucket. Dad had a friend who owned a body shop do the body work for 500 bucks. Dad rebuilt the 283, bored it out, poured it and polished the heads, bolted on a tri-power, three-deuce intake, installed dump pipes, and replaced the power glide with a four on the floor. Mom and Dad had it as their wedding car in 1964, and he sold it shortly thereafter because Mom, who didn't have a license at the time, did not want to learn to drive with a manual floor shift. He sold it for 800 bucks to a guy who rolled and totaled it on the way home after picking it up. I came onto the scene in 1966, and as a child, photos of Dad's car sparked the flame. Hot Rod magazines at the time fanned it, and I finally got my first 57 around 1976 when I was 10 years old. It was a red Hot Wheels car, my favorite in my Hot Wheels fleet. It was not until I was 39 years old back in 2005 when I had the time and the funds, sort of, to realize that dream. I bought a project car off a dude in Sydney for the princely sum of 13800 He imported it from Texas and when it arrived he realized it was in a lot worse shape than he thought and out of his league. My vision for the car was a candy apple red two-door hardtop resto mod. I wanted all the good gear in it. I wanted it modern, I wanted it fast, and I wanted it safe. So we've got to pull the bonnet off for starters. And we've had to take off the internal bonnet release to allow us to get the bonnet off. We're just gonna lay that cable in the engine bay. 57 Chevy's never had this originally. This is an aftermarket thingy. And I put it on there just as a bit of a security measure. I wouldn't think there's ever been a lot of 57 Chev bonnets on the back of an FJ45 before. <laughs> I brought the car home in January 2005, and by March I had the car completely stripped and ready for the body removal. I built a dolly for the body to sit on before starting the removal process. I didn't have a crane, so I jacked the entire car, frame and all, into the air and set the tires on jack stands and blocks of wood. I slid timber 4B2s between the body and the frame, then lowered the frame to the ground and the body stayed on the timber braces. I had to pull the rear tires off to allow the hump in the frame to clear the body above it. I moved the body to the side of the shed and there it sat for a full two years while I worked on the frame and on the engine, all while working a full-time job. All right, our next step is we've got to pull these intake pipes off for the intercooler. It could be a little sticky brock because the pipes have got a clear coat on them. So we are now pulling off the wiring loom because it is also connected to the front clip. And that runs all of the sensors that are on the car, the throttle position sensor, the coolant temperature sensor, the fans and fan relay, all that good gear. Good. Yep. Okay. Bring it down if you wish. Yep, nice. Be clear. Alrighty, beautiful. 
Now my plan was to powder coat the frame a nice gloss black, but I had to complete all the frame mods before that process could occur. This meant stripping it completely bare and fixing any damage. The front frame horn had an impact at some time in its life, so I had to heat it and straighten that using a cutting torch, a floor jack, and a chain concreted into my shed slab. It actually worked quite well. I could then move on to the three main frame mods. Firstly, I installed a triangulated rear end with coilover shocks. This would give the car much better handling than the old leaf springs. This included installation of the mounting points and a cross brace for the shocks to mount to. Secondly, I had to change the engine mounts to suit the more modern small block Chev. Here I've got a dummy core that I used to mock up the mounts. Thirdly, I had to remove the old backyard angle iron cross member and replace it with a purpose-built transmission cross member. I had the frame sandblasted and powder coated gloss black, and that looks as good today as the day I had it done back in 2005. Check out this young lass's face who was applying the powder coating to the frame. What a trooper. While the frame was at the blasters, I did some plating work on several chassis components. The rear diff housing took a bucket load of time and it came out great, but if I had my time over again, I would not bother, as the only time you can actually see it is when the car is up on a hoist. I also plated most of the steering components at home as well, and here is a before and after shot just to exemplify the difference. Here's a before and after of the front suspension setup as well. Again, QA1 coilovers lead the charge here. Alright gentlemen, are we... Ready to take this front clip off? We're ready, but are we confident? I don't know. <laughs> There's only one way to find out. <laughs> exactly. All right. You control it, Ted? Yep. Towards you boys. We are catching on something, We're gentlemen. catching on something. Now the front's good. And I back towards the windscreen a fraction. Up. Holy shit. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's take a breath. You, you need to send that photo to Arch. <laughs> I just stripped a, a race car out. Yeah. Oh my goodness. There we are. We haven't got to where we're getting to yet. Down inside of there is our exhaust manifold. When I had the chassis completed, I moved on to the engine. Matt was in the trade at the time and got me onto a good 4-bolt main 350 010 block. The 010 blocks are sought after because they've got a higher nickel and tin content than the standard blocks, which means they wear better. 4-bolt refers to the number of bolts holding each main bearing cap on. Small block chevs came in 2 and 4-bolt, and 4-bolts obviously being much stronger. The block was acid dipped, board 30 over, and decked. I always knew I was going to turbocharge the motor, so I wanted strong components that could withstand the strain associated with forced induction. As such, it's got a scat forged crank, hyper eutectic pistons, H-beam rods, a crow custom ground turbo cam, dart iron eagle heads, yellow terra roller rockers and pushrod guides, ARP head studs and, and in fact ARP bolts throughout the thing. Basically all the good quality kit. We assembled the motor in my shed starting with the cam bearings and cam before moving on to the pistons and crank. When installing the timing chain, a degree wheel was used to degree in the camshaft as this is very important on performance engines. The dart iron eagle heads were pre-assembled on the bench before mounting them to the block using ARP head studs and nuts. One thing that I always get paid out for is polishing the Welsh plugs and orienting them so that the 1 and 5 eighths inch stamping was sitting up the right way. I don't know what these people are talking about. Once the long motor was completed, I installed it into the chassis and moved on to the turbochargers. A mate Lee from Thomas 4 Parts rebuilt the turbos for me and fabricated a turbo manifold. I coated all the exhaust components in a ceramic paint and then used a barbecue and Jill's oven in the kitchen to actually set that paint off. I kind of got in trouble for that one. I fabricated the rest of the exhaust myself and then wrapped all of the hot bits with this heat cloth or heat tape. I wired the motor up with a Helltech wiring harness and then Matt Lee and myself kicked the thing in the guts. And here's a short video of its first startup. The video doesn't show it very well, but when Matt had his hand on the distributor, we had a bad earth and the MSD unit actually earthed through his arm. And he got a belt that we still laugh about today. Or at least I do.
right, we got down to the engine block. Got the manifold off on the easy side. And what did we find, Matt? We did find a little bit of a leak on this side, didn't we? We have. It was a good call because um, that's uh, number two cylinder. So yeah. the front, front cylinder on yep. that side of the car. We can't say drivers or passengers because <laughs> everyone get confused. So you can see where it's been leaking. Yeah, definitely. And this wasn't even the side that was making the ticking noise. So I imagine the other side's going to look blown completely out. Yeah. Just cleaning the mating surfaces before we pop that in there and throw some flange sealer on it. Here's the front clip. Brock's been kindly wiring things up for me because we've had to cut wires on the front clip. And he's putting these plugs in place, which are a pretty sexy thing. The old girl's looking a bit naked though. The extent of the bodywork necessary was the real black hole of time and one of the reasons the original owner bailed and sold it to me. After clearancing the boot floor for the QA1 shocks, I started to cut all the cancer out of the boot or trunk area for those North American viewers, and there was lots. One good thing about Tri-5 Chevys is that the aftermarket industry makes all the patch panels. I removed the spare tire well and blanked it off, and then welded in the rest of the boot floor patch panels. The beaver panel, which is a known problem area on Tri-5s, and the inside of the rear fins were toast, so I cut them all out and replaced them with fresh metal as well. I used the tail lights and trim pieces to make sure my lines were correct before welding the panels in permanently. The whole process took a full month to complete, working at night and on weekends as my job allowed. Next I moved on to the inner and outer rockers and the associated floor braces. They were toast on both sides of the car. Again I had aftermarket panels to use as replacements. I chopped out the cancerous metal piece by piece until I had a giant gaping hole in the floor. I used ratchet straps and welded in braces to ensure the structural integrity of the car remained while I had these critical bits removed. I also marked all my door gaps and installed and removed the doors a million times to sense check that the body was not misaligned. Once the inner and outer rockers were in place, I started replacing the floor piece by piece until it was completely repaired. Here my son Andrew tests the repairs for structural integrity and I presume it passed as it's still holding up to this day. The biggest and scariest job was replacing the rear quarter panels. Maybe it was the huge size of these panels that made them so intimidating. I'm not certain, but they were indeed intimidating. I chopped the old ones out using a cutoff wheel. It's hard to tell from this photo of the back side of the panel, but these had been repaired on dozens of times over. I found number plates as patch panels and newspaper stuffed into rust holes and bogged over. Once the panels were removed, I targeted the rust in the inner wheel housing and repaired the holes on both sides and the inner wheel arches themselves. There is a bucket ton of work in these areas and once the quarter panels were on, you never see these areas again. I coated all the inner wheel arches in pour 15 before installing the quarter panels. They actually fitted up pretty easily and in the end were not near as difficult as their size might suggest. Moving on to the doors, they too needed a ton of work. The lower quarter of each door was rotted out and I had to re-skin each door as well. After cutting off the original door skin, I sandblasted the inside of the inner door panel, marked a cut line and chopped off the lower portion of the inner door. The replacement panel was lined up and butt welded to the top half of the inner door. I then coated the entire surface of the inner door with pour 15 before moving onto the door skin. I mounted the inner door back onto the car to ensure the repairs I did on them lined up correctly. At that point I fitted the inner door skin and clamped it in place before tacking it in with the MIG. Confident that they were aligned properly, I hammered over the edge of the skin around the inner door frame and finished spot welding it in place. It was a nervous process checking and rechecking fitment, but I got there in the end. The other side of the car got the exact same treatment. The next panel forward were the two front outer guards. They were both rotted out in the lower quarter skin and inner brace. I chopped off the skin and the brace and welded in the replacement patch panels. 
Both the brace and the skin were butt welded in place and ground smooth. The front inner guards were in not much better shape. There was rough sections to cut out and replace and dozens of holes in them that had been drilled over the years for who knows what reason. I replaced the cancerous sections, welded up all the drilled holes before body filling and priming the panels. From there it was a coat of gold base coat, followed by a coat of candy apple red, followed by two coats of clear. The inner guards were done. Next on my list were two inner armrest panels in the back seat area. Mine were rotted out in the bottom corners. I cut the cancer out with a cutting wheel and fabricated replacement panels out of some scrap steel I had lying around. I then filled in the imperfections with some Bondo and sanded it level before hitting both panels with a coat of primer. As these panels would be covered with upholstery, it was not critical to sand them past an 80 grit finish. The bonnet was next on my list. I initially ground the paint off the edges of the bonnet because I knew rust repairs were needed there and I wanted to see what I was up for. There was rot on the left and right edges of the bonnet, both on the skin and the underlying bracing. I chemically stripped the bonnet, removing at least five layers of different color paint. The original color was an ivory, if you were wondering. I would not chemically strip again. It's too messy and a bit slow, especially in a hot climate, even if you cover the stripper with cling wrap to prevent it from drying out. Once stripped and primed, I cut the rust areas out and welded in the patch panels. The boot was a little bit easier than the bonnet because the skin was in good nick. There were just two or three rust patches in the inner frame that needed addressing. Again, the same process was used. Cut the cancer out with a cutoff wheel, weld in the patch panels, grind the welds down, fill with Bondo, sand the Bondo back, and hit it with a coat of primer. So how much rust did I cut out of the car? This is a wheelbarrow full of cancer, and that does not include the two door skins or the two full rear quarter panels. On a positive note, the roof was in excellent shape and didn't require any rust repairs. Now that all the big rust repair jobs were done and the body was as rigid as it was going to get, I started to build a rotisserie. I got the plans off Mr. Google somewhere and bought some steel from my local supplier. I welded all the blue bar up to create this beast. Each end could slide along the lower runners so you could actually use this for any length car. I eventually sold it to a dude restoring a combi. I built this in 2010 and by that time I had bought and installed a hoist, one of the best purchases I've ever made. I picked the body up with the hoist and lowered it onto the rotisserie before bolting it in place. I did put braces in place of the doors just to firm up that body a little bit more. I could then easily access all the areas I needed to. I chemically stripped the roof and everything else that was painted red. I sandblasted the floor inside the car and the floor outside the car, basically any area that I was not worried about warping. I did all the remaining rust repairs on the floor before sealing the entire body up in two-pack epoxy primer. Yes, you support that rock, I can... Well, after a couple of Saturdays wrenching on the car, we got the new exhaust manifold gaskets installed on both banks after coating them with a generous dose of flange sealer. After that, it was the long climb uphill putting the car all back together. If it's one thing I regret on this restoration, it's the difficulty I created for myself in doing simple repairs and maintenance. For example, changing the spark plugs is a good four hour job because everything is so difficult to get to. A big constraint I was working with is that the laws where I live state that everything must be contained within the engine compartment and the inner guards. That made things very tight indeed. Hmm, in hindsight, maybe I should have pushed that legal envelope a little bit. Time to button up the remainder of the car. This guard here needs to be aligned properly. That guard on that side is completely finished. Then we need to hook up all of the intake plumbing. Connect up the radiator. Pop the bonnet back on. And that's going to probably get us done. Oh, and the bumper. You got to put the bumper back on as well. All right, I got to replace the battery in this beast. It is in the boot, but to access it, you actually got to get it from behind the seat. So I've got to pull this seat panel off and we'll get that battery out of there. I put 
put a new battery in the boot. That old battery was Cactus. It was from 2016. So five years old. Then we'll be ready to kick her in the guts. There's our bonnet all ready to go back on. And here's a flashback. Here's an example of one of a million little things that you do on a restoration that flies under the radar. The original 57 had provision for one speaker. I used the existing speaker holes and created a cardboard template that I used to cut holes mirrored on the other side so I could have two 6x9s mounted under the parcel shelf. The seats were out of a Holden Calais and they're all electric. I had to do some trimming on the rear seats to get them to fit and had to weld in some bracketry to get the rear center console to mount properly. The upholsterer then did the rest of the foam work which I'll cover off a bit later in the video. Once I had the front seats mounted in the right location, I began fabricating the center console. Plywood, fiberglass, and Bondo were my friends here. I wanted it to incorporate the shifter, all my aftermarket gauges, a storage compartment, and my stereo. And this is how it's turned out in the end. This center console that you see, I custom made that. Those are the original 57 courtesy lights. And underneath that panel there, I've got a rocker switch here in the center console. If I activate that rocker switch, up comes my stereo unit. Activate it in the opposite direction, and it simply hides away under this little flap here. In terms of instrumentation, I've got a fuel pressure gauge, a pyrometer for the left and the right bank, oil temperature, Wideband O2 sensor for both the left and the right bank and a boost in the center. Fast forward to 2011 and after hundreds of hours of bodywork, the car was ready for paint. I loaded it up on the trailer and took it to the paint booth where Steve Singleton shot a house of color candy apple red. He started with a base coat of gold before hitting it with two coats of candy red and then two coats of clear. Steve really did an amazing job and the car is a reflection of his skills as a top class body man. After baking the paint in the booth, I trailered her back home to begin installing the Dynamat. This is a sticky backed butyl rubber product that's used as a sound deadener. The panels on the Chevy are prone to wobble harmonics because they're so large and this stuff eliminates it completely. I affixed it from the top side of the inner firewall all the way through the passenger compartment into the boot. I also did the inside of the doors and the roof. It took a few days to install the Dynamat and that allowed the paint to cure fully. I needed this to occur because the next stage was wet sanding and polishing. I wanted a flat mirror finish with zero orange peel. I started with 800 grit and wet sanded every single panel. It was then on to 1000, then 1200, then 1500, then 2000 then 3,000, and finally the buff. The process is very time consuming, but the labor results in a show car finish. It makes that big of a difference. That reflectivity that you see in the boot, that gives you a good idea of how flat that paint job is. The leaves on the trees and the reflection are nice and sharp, as are the clouds in the sky. After wet sanding, I could begin to install all the chrome, aluminium, and stainless bling. Any of the pot metal pieces, these chrome plated pot metal, those are all aftermarket because they pit like crazy on the originals. That grill bar is a copy, aftermarket copy of the original. All of the stainless steel trim is original 57 stuff. Then I sand it all back with very fine grit sandpaper removed any of the dings and dents out of it and then popped it on the buff wheel. These aluminium inserts, they're aftermarket. Mine were pretty much toast. But the stainless steel strips themselves are all original and they came up an absolute treat. There's a lot of work there. Days and days worth of polishing. It's not a fun job. I can give you the hot tip. This photo of the firewall exemplifies the amount of work that goes into just one small section of the car. You can see that all the unnecessary holes were filled before grinding smooth, filling, priming, and of course final paint. There's days of work in this panel alone. After all that wet sanding, it was time to mate up the body to the frame for the last time. All new body mounts and stainless steel hardware were used in this exercise, of course. 
The tune port injection manifold you see in this photo was swapped out for a tunnel ram type injection system because the TPI intake was just too restrictive. I installed all the ancillary systems onto the motor like cooling and fueling before assembling the front clip. Again, there is so much detail work that one can fail to appreciate. This instrument cluster, for example. The gauge cluster itself has got uh, CCI gauges in it. And it basically has a pretty stock look to it, but it gives you modern type gauges. So you got oil pressure, you got your RPM, you got your volts, you got your temp, and you got your fuel. So if I kick her in the guts, you can see up comes our RPM. Oil pressure is looking good. A little over 13 volts. And she's just started, so she's not warmed up yet. Here's another one of those small modifications that you never ever see, but it's a big one. All of the power componentry are obviously here in the door, but if you look here, there's no wires. And the reason there's no wires is I've actually hollowed that hinge out. So the wires are running through the center of this hinge. That was a lot of work. It was then off to the upholsterers for a full custom interior makeover. This included the installation of the sound system in the boot area. The material is a light gray leather and red suede combination, and it turned out amazing. There's our door card. Now the interior, the upholstery work, I did not do myself. There was a company called Daltrim, which I used to do the interior. However, I've done a couple of little fancy things on it. So you can see here, those are the original 57 crank handles. And if I activate that crank handle by pushing it down, Power windows. Push it up 15 degrees and up the window comes. Same thing with our quarter glass. Up and it closes. That's pretty cool. In the interior the dash is pretty much stock standard. Got to have your requisite fuzzy dice. It does have a vintage air system in it. I have not hooked up the AC system yet, but there is the vintage air. Original 57 dash clock. Aftermarket mirror. It's got the day and night flicker on it. The original mirrors didn't have that. The headliner is all red velour or red velvet. In the back here, same as before. Flick that down. Down comes our glass, up, up goes our glass. I've installed a couple of little switches here that are courtesy light switches. So you depress that and the courtesy light in the roof over the individual passengers comes on. If I put the park lights on, that little LED illuminates in the center as well. So that's pretty cool. Original 57 coat hangers. The gearbox is a six-speed Tremec out of a Camaro and the shift pattern is one, two, three, four, five, six and reverse is up in the top corner. I put a B&M T-bar on that just because I love the feel of it. It's got a really, really good feel. If we have a look in the boot, got two 10-inch subwoofers. This panel here represents, that's the Chevy V obviously and the original Chevy script and these here on the side panels kind of replicate or mirror those little gills on the front guard. Got the 57 Chev fuel injection script. That was actually available in 57. You could get a mechanical fuel injection on these things. And on the back here we've got two antennas. Those were options as well back in 57. The bumpers on the car are all reproduction stuff out of the States. And here's something you don't see on the Tri-5s too often, are these bullets that are colored in gold. Originally the Tri-5s had just a, simply bl a simple blank off plate there. Then as an option, you could get a bullet, a rubber bullet, a black rubber bullet. But because this is a Bel Air model, which has got all the gold flashing on it and the gold accents, I like these gold bullets, which are just pretty cool. It sort of offsets the whole thing. A crap ton of work has gone into getting these panels dead straight. That roof was actually hail damaged at our old house. 
so I had to repair all the hail damage. The boot lid had some gouges and rust in it that had to be cut out. This rear quarter panel is a replacement aftermarket quarter panel. The original one was toast. That door skin is a aftermarket door skin. The original one was toast. And this front guard is the original front guard but had quite a few dings in it. Now if you look down the side of that car, it is dead laser straight. It's not hard to get it like that. It just takes a long time and a lot of work. But nothing fancy. There you can see the gold base sort of coming out through the clear coat and through the candy. Hopefully that's coming up in the camera. I got the car up in the air to do an oil change. I won't bother showing that, that's pretty boring. But I will go through some of the mods to the car from the underside. So starting at the back of the car, fuel tank. That's actually out of an F-150. And if you have a look along there, it fits absolutely beautifully. You know, it's got bloody an inch around the perimeter to spare, which is awesome. I welded in a pickup and a return for the fuel system. And then I fabricated this bracket here to put the tank hangers off of. So that one's worked out pretty good. The fuel system itself is all this braided line. That's a fuel filter there. Runs up along the chassis rail into an aeromotive fuel pump, into a second fuel filter, and then of course up to the engine to feed the injectors. So what I have done for a suspension system is put a triangulated four link into it. The beauty with a suspension system like that is these bars prevent the axle going forward and backwards and the triangulated components up there prevent the axle from shifting left to right. So it really does lock that rear axle in there beautifully. I've got coilovers, QA1 coilovers on both sides. On the top of the coilovers, I've actually put this bar in to mount the top of the shocks too. Originally, the shocks came from the diff housing and they went up through the floor, through the boot floor there. And oftentimes in these Tri-5 Chevys, you find that boot floor flogged out because the shocks are just going through some sheet metal. Pretty piss poor design, really. Originally, the car had a leaf sprung rear end. There's the original leaf hanger there. And up on the front, I've chopped it off. Of course, the, one of the other reasons I wanted to put a triangulated rear end in this thing is because the original spring hangers ran right here and you couldn't get a decent wide tire on it. But because I don't have those spring hangers there, I can get a decent tire on there. And that's a 275-5017. And you can see, still got some decent space. That's pretty close, I got about a finger width there. But as you can see, there's been no rubbing whatsoever. And I have flogged the bejesus out of this car. And on the fronts, I'm running two 15 50R17s with sort of the old 60s style Krager SS rims. I just love them. I love these spinners as well. Very cool. The brake system is a Willowood six piston. They're cross drilled and slotted rotors as well. And that pulls the car up beautifully. The diff has got a Detroit limited slip diff in the center as a diff center. The rear braking system is out of a Cadillac. The gearbox is completely rebuilt. It's a Borg Warner or a Tremec T56 six speed that originally came out of a Camaro. Tri-5 Chevys didn't have a sway bar. So I've got an aftermarket sway bar on that, which just helps it plant a little bit better. I've got a set of drop spindles, two inch drop spindles on the car as well. And that uh, obviously just lowers the front end a little bit. Because this was a frame off restoration, you can see the underside of the car has all been painted and body worked properly. So although you can't see it from the top side, it is a fair income frame off. And the underside is just as immaculate as the top side. Obviously it's a twin turbo. Those are T3, T4 hybrids. Water cooled and obviously oil's running through for the bearings. Fuel pressure regulator, which is boost compensated. And of course, a fuel injection system, which is managed by a Haltech unit.
brake master cylinder. The original 57 only had one chamber, that's got front and rear. And there's a proportioning valve for a, a disc brake, disc brake setup. The waste gates are located down there, running off of the exhaust manifold. The blow off valve is up here on the intake side. Power steer, a dual spall fan, and Griffin radiator, and a reasonably large air to air intercooler. Aftermarket horns, those are copies of the 57 Chev originals. HID headlights, so I don't have the old candles. Let's join the boys for the final wrap up on this exhaust leak. All right, we got our engine in. We got our guards bolted up. That's our bonnet cable, cable yep. Yeah. Everything's clear of the fan belt. I think we're ready to kick it in the guts. Sounds like your fuel pressure. All pressure. It sounds a bit quieter than when we last heard it. Oh, I can hear the injectors clicking now. <laughs> Sweet. Nice. That's just that's just the glue. And our handprints. Yeah. Sweet. Injectors, you're right. <laughs> Very good, awesome. Mate, it hasn't it hasn't been that quiet. Forever. Forever. Yeah. Basically not long after initial fire up. Let's wrap this video up and go for a cruise in a twin turbocharged 57 Chevy. Enjoy the ride. I know I'm gonna. Thanks for watching everybody. Keep your shiny side up. Till next time. Bye now.